Okay, I'm just gonna I, I am just gonna pull the plug and we'll get get this going. My time management skill is what's keeping you from drinks. So if you can all get amongst okay, we just got the influx. Uh, if you could come to the front, that would be amazing. Thank you. Okay, we'll get started while that everyone starts finds their seat. Uh, my name is Melindy. I'm uh, one of the directors at the Bureau of Crime Stats and Research. Thank you everyone for coming to the late session about corrections. Uh, we have three very interesting studies about uh, three jurisdictions, so that's really going to be quite fun. There's way more seats down the front, guys, if you want to come over here. Um, less time for me, more time for the speakers. So I'm going to pass you to the first speaker, uh, Steve Mershon, from the uh, University of Melbourne, but talking about the Quebec study. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here presenting this paper. It's a joint work with uh, William Arbour, who's a professor at University of Montreal. And uh, we're going to present you our results uh, from the context of Quebec, where we're from. And before I start, I must just quickly mention that uh, all the opinions expressed here are uh, only ours, and they don't necessar necessarily reflect those of the ministry that granted us access to the data or of the Quebec Parole Board, uh, which uh, allowed us to assist to parole hearings and uh, with whom we discussed thoroughly to understand everything. Parole is the conditional early release of inmates the practice can have very obvious benefits if we have reasons to believe that incarceration is no longer appropriate for someone, then releasing this person sooner can reduce prison overcrowding and incarceration cost. Um, of course, the usual uh, worry is that uh, releasing someone sooner could cause crime. If this person commits crime while on parole, there are uh, some People also believe that reduced incarceration time could imply a small, smaller deterrence effect, lesser punishment that, would, uh, that could increase recidivism in theory. But importantly, parole can be more than just a, a, a reduction of incarceration time. When someone leaves prison as a parolee, the sentence is still undergoing, and this gives uh, parole officers uh, leverage to still exert some form of influence on the offender after, throughout the transition back to community. And depending on the context, this influence can uh, imply significant rehabilitation assistance, uh, like in the context that we're going to study here. And this can also impact recidivism. Overall, given all these possible effects of parole, it's not clear what the effect is uh, on crime. And it's difficult to estimate empirically the effect of parole on crime. We cannot simply compare those who get parole to those who don't. They are completely different groups, not comparable to each other. And so because of that challenge, the empirical evidence on the causal effect of parole um, is kind of limited. Some studies have uh, managed through var various uh, empirical strategy to do it, and still the findings are mixed. Uh, some have found um, in Israel that it can decrease recidivism. In the US, some have found no effect or that it can increase rearrest. A study in New South Wales from Boxa um, that uses an approach very similar to what I'm going to uh, present you here, and if you think that the approach makes sense, you might want to have a look at their work as well. Uh, they find that it decreased uh, reconvictions. So these uh, different results, could, uh, what we need to understand is which specific practices make parole successful, and in which context uh, it is appropriate and for whom it is appropriate. And we're not there yet. Um, we also need to develop a, a, a rigorous approach to measuring recidivism. 
in order to judge of the effect of parole. There are different ways we can use, and in the context of parole, I'm going to show that it can have huge implications on the results, and I'm going to measure recidivism in different ways and uh, show that how the combination of results can be um, counterintuitive and lead to different results, but within the framework that, that we're proposing, it all makes sense. We're studying the, the effect of parole in the context of provincial prisons in Quebec. So in, in Canada, we have federal prisons and provincial prisons. And if you're sentenced with more than two years, you go to federal prisons, less than two years, a provincial prisons. We have the data on the provincial prisons. And uh, to be eligible for parole, offenders need to have a sentence of at least six months. So we're studying the population with a sentence of at, between six months and two years. It's also a very selective process. Not a large share of people obtain parole. And it's a selection of offenders that are really uh, considered at lesser risk of committing further crimes. Another reason why we can't simply compare them to those who don't get parole. It's also a context where there's significant rehabilitation assistance that is provided to parolees, uh, and it's not only, but mostly provided in the form of a stay in a halfway house that includes all sorts of services, and I will describe that. What we do, just to summarize before we start, we estimate the causal effect of parole on recidivism and incarceration, and I'll come back to why the, dis the distinction is important. How do we do this? We will use the propensities of individual parole board members to grant parole or to not grant parole. And using that data, we can uh, capture some variations that would allow us to isolate the, isolate the causal effect of parole. I'll come back to this method. And simply, what we find is that parole seems to be increasing significantly the likelihood of reincarceration, but decreases the likelihood of reconviction. And to make sense of these results, we develop a framework where we estimate the effect of parole on incarceration time, and we decompose this effect into different channels that comes from incarceration, that comes from technical violation of parole conditions, for example, or incarceration that results for, from future sentences. Let's start with the context, because the context is really important, I think. So as I've said, uh, inmates with sentences of more than six months are eligible uh, to, to apply for parole. If they choose to apply, the hearing happens always at the same time, at one third of the sentence. And uh, at the hearing, it is decided if they are granted parole or not by the parole board members. And if they obtain it, they leave prison immediately. Still, 50% uh, of eligible uh, offenders choose to renounce to the right of a hearing. And why is that? There could be many reasons. It could be that uh, they have low chance of obtaining it, they don't bother. The, the, the process seems to be unpleasant for, for many offenders. But maybe more importantly, parole comes with a longer ter time under supervision. And this is because of a special rule that uh, is meant to incentivize good behaviors in prison. Every two days of good behavior in prison, in Canada, reduces your incarceration time by one day. This is meant to incentivize good behaviors. But this practice does not apply to parolees. So as a result of that, most prisoners who remain incarcerated will exit prison at two thirds of their sentence. And if they leave under parole, they will be, uh, they will need to uh, respect the parole conditions until the term of the sentence. Because of that, and 
probably many other reasons. Uh, there's a self-selection effect, meaning that many uh, people choose not to bother with parole at all. Uh, there's another um, selection effect that comes from the parole board members. They select people who they think are the less at risk. They review the cases extensively. They interview the person. They read recommendation letters from the, the program officers. They consult the risk evaluation or the risk assessment core, the LSCMI evaluation. They look at whether or not the person has participated in programs. And the person during the parallel hearing needs to have prepared a credible rehabilitation plan that is evaluated during the hearing. If parole is granted, um, the, the, the parole board members also uh, choose the series of conditions that need to be respected. It could be, uh, there, there are 60 potential conditions. One condition that is always discussed, almost always discussed in parole hearings is the stay in a halfway house. Uh, this is always discussed and it's always part of this rehabilitation plan. The person needs to contact one of these houses through their uh, program officers to establish their rehabilitation plan. This is uh, what a halfway house looks like in Quebec. Sometimes when we hear halfway houses, we think of the US ones. Uh, they, if you look at pictures of halfway houses in the US, they don't look like that. Um, <laughs> It's, and basically the philosophy, the philosophy is to offer an environment that is mentally healthy and to offer other forms of assistance. So they will decorate during, during Christmas, they will have domestic animals uh, all the time. Um, the, the, it's seen as a compromise between incarceration and release and it covers basic needs like shelter and food Parolees can live freely, um, and sometimes these halfway houses are compared with uh, open prisons that we can find in uh, some European countries. Uh, they are not entirely free. They must report to employees. They must always spend the night there. They must participate in programs or uh, therapy if this is part of their conditions. They must, in some cases, seek work, or if they found work, they must show up to work and the employees from the halfway houses make sure that this is respected. The cost per offender is lower than uh, incarceration because of it's a lesser, secu the, the security is uh, not on the same level. It's uh, less than half the cost per day. So I'll talk quickly about summary statistics and, uh, and discuss the data that we have very briefly. We have administrative data on all the prisoners in the Quebec provincial prisons, although we also have a sentence file that uh, inform you if the person is, uh, will, is if someone who leaves the uh, provincial prisons and commit recidivism in the future, recidivate and gets a sentence to a federal prisons. We can observe that, so we can measure we can, any form of reconviction uh, and we observed some characteristics that I'm not going to uh, describe here, but some demographics, risk assessment scores that are very predictive of recidivism. And we have these data from 2007 uh, to 2020. The other part of the data that we have that is very important here is the data on parole board members. Uh, and we have parole board members identifiers, anonymized, of course, we have around 30 parole board members, and uh, we observe their decisions and uh, the conditions that they will require. I'll come back to why this is extremely important to have these data to estimate what we want to estimate. We have these that this part of the data we have until 2015. So we, we're going to look at recidivism five years after that from our other part of the data. We define recidivism by two, uh, we use two definitions. Uh, first definition is reincarceration. This is a measure that is sometimes used. 
you could be reincarcerated because of technical viola violation of parole conditions or breaches, or uh, because of new conviction. It could also be, it could also be um, pretrial detention. And the second definition that we use is the a new conviction, a measure that is uh, used as well often. We're going to look at these measures within a certain time window starting at the parole hearing, for, so one third of the sentence. And this is important to keep in mind because when we compare the short term effect to the longer term effect, when we look at short term effect, potentially only parolees can commit anything, any crime, because those who have not been granted parole yet are still inca incarcerated. Here are just uh, summary statistics, just to describe the, the rate of uh, recidivism, reincarceration in this case. In the dark, the, the dark blue bars show us the, uh, the, the population who didn't ask, who renounced to the right of a parole hearing. And these are the ones with the highest reincarceration rate. So you can see that potentially uh, they don't ask for parole hearings because they're more at risk uh, and they maybe know that they don't have a chance. That shows you some self-selection effect. The light blue bars show the, those who have applied for a hearing but were denied. And the red bars show you the reincarceration rates for those who did get parole. The reincarceration rate for those who got parole is higher in the short term than any other groups because they're out of prison sooner. And this one year period covers in large part this period where they out, but the, uh, those that didn't get parole are not out yet. Reconviction rates are uh, similar, except that we don't observe a high re reconvictions uh, from, uh, for parolees in the short term. But parolees are, tend to have lower recidivism rate, uh, especially in the longer term. Now, these are not uh, causal effect. The, the groups differ for all sorts of reasons. So here's what we do to uh, estimate uh, the, the, the part that we can really, uh, that is really attributable to parole. We can't just compare them. So um, what we do is that we use the data on the parole board members. Uh, more precisely, we estimate the propensity of each parole board members to grant parole. And then using that, we use a well-established method of, uh, to uh, isolate the causal effect of the decision that is often called a judge leniency design or judge fixed effect design. Uh, I'm, just to illustrate the approach without equations, I have some drawings. <laughs> Bas basically, some, an offender can be randomly allocated to a parole board member that is lenient or less lenient. And this is something that is, in our context at least, according to all the tests that we did in the paper, that seems to be very random. So depending on the parole board member that the person will face, you can be granted parole or denied parole. So you can have one person facing a very lenient parole member who gets parole, and think of an identical person who faced just someone different, and because of that, the parole is denied. That uh, information gives us uh, a way to uh, incorporate in our analysis some variations that, are, that don't depend on the characteristics of offenders, and, do, and thus we <coughs> Uh, rule out, <coughs> we, we isolate the causal part uh, from the selection bias. We do that through an instrumental variable approach. We estimate the propensity of each parole member to grant parole and then use, uh, esti we estimate the effect of parole decisions that are explained by these propensities. And we ca it's a well-known result uh, that that uh, these methods, uh, they estimate the effect of parole for people at the margins. So meaning that those people who would maybe get a different decisions if they faced some parole board member or not. Uh, and in our context, 
uh, these individuals at the margin are likely, very likely, to uh, be required to stay in a halfway house if they are granted parole. So sorry for the table. You don't have to look at it. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think the important part is that when we look at the incarceration effect in the longer run, uh, we find that parole increases the probability of reincarceration within five years after the hearing, but it decreases the probability of reconviction by the same amount. So to make sense of these results, we're uh, estimating the effect of parole on incarceration time, and we decompose this effect into a different channel. The first channel is very obvious, it's the release effect, the effect of releasing people sooner. That's, so in our context, it's very clear what this, what this is. The incarceration decrease from the two-third to the one-third of the sentence. The second channel is technical violation of parole conditions. When this happens, the person will be reincarcerated in some cases. And uh, we observe that from the data as well. The last part is the reduction on uh, incarceration that results from uh, future sentences. And when we use our instrumental variable strategy to estimate these effects, we find that uh, the, the, in total, parole in our context decreases incarceration time by uh, around uh, 118 days and that uh, despite having all these people out of prison, the, 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 new, the number of new crimes that we observe are lower. The, 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 the future sentences decrease. Uh, we, have, we do observe people coming back to prison because of technical violations of parole conditions, but this is usually seen as something that is uh, of lesser severity than uh, incarceration resulting from new sentences. So we uh, conclude that parole in this context can, uh, it can decrease total time, of it, total incarceration times while uh, reducing new crimes. This is a win-win situation that I think deserves attention. It's important to understand the context because I would not uh, argue that parole is always appropriate for anyone. It's a result that stands in a context with su significant rehabilitation assistance and for a selection of prisoners that are rel relatively uh, low risk. Um, if you have uh, some interest in these questions, uh, this is my email and I would be happy uh, to hear from you as well. Thank you very much. You also have the opportunity now to ask directly questions without having to have to email Stephen. Yes. Uh, so, uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, yep. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I was just wondering if there are such good results based on your research, why have the self referral system in place? Why wouldn't you just put all offenders to um, the board for decision? Well, um, that's, that comes back to what I said at the end. This is a result that stands for those people. And the result for other people is not yet known. So I would not venture as to recommend it to be offered to anyone, but I would venture as encouraging people to really consider offering these kinds of condition to at least some types of people that are com comparable. Um, yeah, that's the safe uh, academic way of answering the question, I think. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, Steve, do you think the mechanism is the um, therapeutic benefits of the halfway house or do you, is that is that what you're suggesting or could there be anything else I don't know the harm of prison or I don't know if you've got thoughts about that that's a very good question we can't complete 
completely rule out that it's something else and that without these halfway house it would it wouldn't work uh, but this is what we find and we find it in a context where these halfway house are re you know gu really guide what's going on so there is room for further research on that question for sure yeah I was just wondering if you compared your results to the general baseline of parole as a broad cohort and whether there was any significant difference. So what do you mean the general baseline of parole? As in um, the effects of parole on reconvision rates or reincarceration versus the cohort that was selected and whether there was any significant difference between a general baseline for offenders generally as opposed to your specific cohort? I would need to think about your question a little bit more, actually. Um, the parolees that we observe are, you know, they're not representative of any other group in the sense that uh, they're very selected. So um, we're not claiming that uh, they're comparable to a broader population that is observable in the prison. Um, but that's, that's why we wanted to describe exactly the, the context and how they were selected. It's, imp it's important to understand that how, how they're selected to understand who they are. But no, I don't think they're comparable. If that was your question, and I'm sorry if it's not, we can talk about it for if you want. Thank you.